Hey everyone, I'm Malford. This is another behind the scenes. Today we're talking to Tristan, who's the lead coder on Worlds Adrift. Hello Tristan. Hi Malford, how are you going? Not bad, how are you doing? Good, good. very good. Yeah, so today we've got some pretty tough questions for you. I'm ready. Okay, good, good. The first one is about uh, our world. Obviously we've talked a lot about how unique our world is, but I think it'd be interesting for people to understand a little bit more about what makes it unique. Yeah, so, yeah, compared to other game worlds, ours is different in a few key ways. So, um, one thing that makes it uh, different to a lot of worlds is it, it's just its raw size. Compared to a lot of game worlds, it is really quite large. At the moment, um, you know, it's about 36 by 36 kilometers, but in the future we hope to grow this to be larger and larger. And um, as you start getting into these larger worlds, you start dealing with issues around physics and positions. So. One of the issues that we have with uh, positions of players in the world is there's only so much precision in a variable that um, you can you can represent. So if a player travels to the extent of what a variable can store, um, they can no longer travel anymore. So to deal with this, we remap coordinates in the world based on the player's position. We do this every time they sort of reach some sort of limit. And uh, generally, physics systems don't like this. You're, you're, you're mucking them up, and the state that they understand changes. So we have a lot of unique in and interesting problems that come up as we remap the positions of players, and you know things like just stuff shooting off, or you know players disappearing into nowhere. So lots of stuff um, to sort around that. Uh, another unique uh, part of our, our world is persistence. Um, so what I mean by this is we store a lot of game state um, for a very long time. So um, what I'm talking about is things that players do in the world we remember. So ship battles, um, you know, ships crashing into the island. You know, the remains of those ships will remain for a very long time. Um, people killing um, all the creatures on an island and wiping out a, a you know a local uh, ecology. You know that that sort of stuff persists. Cutting down trees and the logs on the tree uh, on the islands. They'll, they'll persist, and this is different compared to, say, other MMOs where you enter a raid instance, kill the boss, and jump back out. Everything resets once you're gone. Um, this is different in our world. We try to remember everything, um, and because of this, we actually deal with sort of really large save files for the world. Compared to your normal game, you might have a couple of megas of save file. Worlds Drift, our worlds represent gigabytes and gigabytes of data that we need to manage for, you know, representing everything that went on in our world. Um, so yeah, that's that's something else that's unique. Another thing is that we are simulating everything in the world. We want our game world to feel really unique um, and alive, and we do this by simulating a lot of um, real world game, uh, not game systems, but real world sort of environment systems. So weather, all our weather in our world is simulated across the whole world. It's a unique weather pattern all the time. Um, and that means, you know, cloudscapes change and storms change and all these sorts of things based on as close to real world patterns as we can um, imagine. Um, also creatures, we simulate creature ecology. So, you know, creatures are born, they live a life, you know, they fight each other and they feed and they eventually die and have children of their own and all this sort of stuff. And um, there's many other systems where, you know, we're simulating as well, day-night cycles and trees growing and, um, you know, the world sort of, uh, becoming more and more dilapidated as time goes on. So yeah, we're trying to make everything feel as real and um, you know interesting as possible by simulating a lot of systems, which games kind of do in a way um, localized on the player. A player comes into there, they'll simulate stuff for a little bit, and then the player leaves, they just stop simulating. For us, we're simulating all the time because that adds interesting stories to maybe you've wiped out creatures on an island, but. Uh, eventually they come back because they've migrated from another island or maybe you didn't get the last one and now they've sort of, um, you know, you know, bred basically like rabbits and, and repopulated an island. And then the last thing that makes us unique is that pretty much everything, all the islands in our game, are user generated content. So we have people that use our island creator to create islands and then we Create, they curate these islands and bring them into our games for other players to play with and, and enjoy. Um, and because our worlds are so big, we need so much content to fill them, and we would never be able to do all those islands ourselves. So the users actually really help us build this world out and make it feel unique and make it feel special because no one builds the same island twice. Yeah. So everything is, is kind of unique in that sense. So 
yeah, that's why our world is a lot different to a lot mm. of other game worlds and why it represents so many challenges in terms of technology and stuff yeah. like that. Well, you mentioned the islands there, and actually that's an interesting point that you know, a lot of people have been asking about. We've had a hell of a lot of islands since we made the last map and that went live, so you know, a lot of the islands in the game are quite old. There's a lot of new ones in there ready to go. I'm sure people would like a bit of insight into why we haven't rolled out a new map with new islands. Yeah, so yeah, that is a really good question. So we have a few challenges to deal with when we want to refresh our worlds. Um, so the, the main challenge is, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of state that we store. So um, we store a huge amount of state representing the world, and that represents the world as it is now, including the islands that are in there and things like that. So if we start changing islands and start changing what represents our world, we start modifying that state in ways that's hard to manage. So um, we're working on technology to allow us to do this a bit easier in the future, but for the time being, the only way we can really um, move forwards because there's so much data to trawl through is just to clear all that data up. Yeah. So wipe the world to be able to bring in a new world. And, you know, we don't want to wipe the world lightly because that's, you know, a lot of players' experiences and histories and things like that that we're just wiping out. But, um, you know, we'd, we want to do this to bring in a new world soon, so we will. But as I mentioned, we're working on technology to avoid this in the future. Yeah. Uh, world wipe should one day become a thing of the past mm. and we have just a long living world. And the way we plan on doing that in the future is being able to dynamically replace islands or add them. So yeah. organic systems that allow islands to spawn from the clouds below and rise up into the world or them to slowly deteriorate back into the clouds if we want to get rid of all of ones and yeah. things like that. And so this takes a bit of work to make sure that we can do all this without you know, destroying physics. There's lots of physics on an island and people interacting with islands. We don't want them to you know, destroy everything as they're sinking within the clouds and we don't want people to be hit by an island as it raises from the clouds and then we've also got to manage all that state as well mm. what happens to the state of an island as it sinks um, we've got to clear that up we've got to make sure that we don't leave anything behind and we're not introducing bugs just by removing an island so there's a big system there that we have to work towards um, but eventually that's how we plan, plan on refreshing the world or even making it larger yeah. just by organically repopulating islands and things like that okay and as, I guess there's one other thing that um, holds us back a little bit, which is the export process for those islands. Yes, yeah, yeah, that is correct. So once players are sort of, they've built their islands, they've put them up on our Steam workshop, um, we have then the challenge of taking these assets that are designed for the island creator and translating them into a representation suitable for hosting on our servers and hosting to players within the MMO world. Um, and this is a lengthy process, unfortunately, to go from something the players created to something that we can then use within the world, because we need to do things like make sure it works within the game engine we're using, Unity. Make sure that um, you know all the things that we spawn on island, trees, rocks, chests, all, all that sort of stuff, that they spawn correctly on an island as well, because um, you know in the island creator you don't put a lot of our game objects on there like data banks and chests and and you know all the sort of things that naturally spawn in the game and we're going to make sure that they spawn in okay they're not an issue and there's just an island also just represents a huge amount of data as well for hundreds and hundreds of islands this re represents you know almost hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of data that we need to process um, and each time we change code or upgrade a version of unity or move forwards with the game it's you have to bring that data forwards with you. Um, you've got to ensure that new code works with old islands, or up, you know we can update the old islands for new code and things like that. And that's a process, and that takes time. Um, we are building systems to make this towards doing the organic bringing islands in. Then we're also making sure that we're keeping track on any new islands that people people are creating. So doing things like when someone creates an island in Steam. We have an automated process that exports it, gets it ready for the game, and makes it available as soon as possible. Um, but uh, you know that's lots of work that we need to yet put in, and so at the moment it's all a bit manual. But yeah. we're working towards that. So in the meantime, before we have a chance to build a new map and before we have a chance to do the dynamic systems, we are planning to do a world wipe to just sort of reset everything so people can 
uh, enjoy the game without the baggage of the world that's uh, persisted so far? Yeah, so in the current closed beta stage of the game, um, you know, lots of changed, lots has changed over that time. And each time we introduce new features um, or we, you know, change a feature or things like that, we inadvertently have to also make sure that the state of the world comes along for the ride. Um, and this means that sometimes we may miss a bit of state upgrade and then it introduces bugs and causes weird stuff like, I don't know, all the campfires on an island all of a sudden grouping together and things like that. We've seen that in the past. Um, and this can mean that the world can, uh, you know, get into a state that's not ideal, not what we'd want for um, a game out of close beta and things like that. So we've been working towards making this process smoother upgrading the versions, making sure we don't introduce bugs as we try to keep old state. But at some point, you start working on features or you start working on stuff that just makes that work too hard. There's too much data there to process. Um, the amount of effort we'd put into bringing that history forwards with us is too much. And so at some points, yeah, like um, in our recent uh, soon-to-be update, we want to wipe the world to make it a lot easier for us to introduce some new features and things like that without having to spend a lot of time migrating that state forwards with us. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's why we'll be doing our most recent update to get rid of a lot of old stuff that was buggy or just a lot of old stuff that people left around the world over time because they've treated this game at the moment in sort of testing phase because it is it's a it's a test so everyone's you know jumping in and trying out all the new ship parts and building lots and leaving it there or you know exploring the world and stuff like that and then um you know leaving trash around the place and we want to get rid of that and make it fresh again so that's where the world wipe comes in yeah so we talked about having a wipe before and we promised it to the community but obviously it hasn't happened yet is there any way you can go into why we've been delaying the wipe? Yeah, so uh, the main reason we delayed the wipe is because the world wipe's quite a big event. You know, it re completely resets the state of the world and, you know, players have stuff invested in the world currently. Mm. Um, even though it is built up with some bugs and trash and stuff over there, there's still um, some stuff that people have invested in there. So we don't want to take a world wipe lightly. We don't want to just wipe the world at any point because you know that's effectively deleting someone's save game right yeah. um so we we need to be careful when we do this and um finding the right point to do it is important because we want to find a time where we're we're introducing lots of new features that also make it worthwhile mm. so you know are we introducing new features now that would be too hard to bring state forwards on yes no yeah. um if we can make do then maybe we should you know limp along for a little bit with the world as it is just so we're saving up that big wipe yeah. event um to be at the best time yeah. like what makes the most sense for the players what makes the most sense for the new features coming in the game things like that so they're they're, they're the main reasons it's mm. been delayed it's just it hasn't quite been the right time yeah, yet. we don't we want to be doing a wipe every update right? no um but having said that we might get into that situation soon mm. where we ha kind of have to do a wipe for each update as we're preparing for the next stage of the game. Yeah. Um, soon we're, we're doing a wipe um, for the next version because there's some features coming in that a wipe makes sense for. Mm -hmm. um, and then going forwards, there's more features coming in that another wipe makes sense for that we didn't want to delay this update for. Yeah. So we decided to, well, let's just wipe the world again so we can get some features out. Um, qu pretty quickly after this one without delaying stuff yeah. and then finally we're hoping to finally have a new world soon yeah and having a new world as I mentioned earlier in our current state means we need to wipe because we can't do that organic growing and changing of the world yet so we're gonna have to wipe for that as well yeah. so yeah there's lots of cool stuff coming up and lots of things that mean that making white doing a wipe just makes our job that much easier and mm. trying to get ready for the next stage of the game yeah. um so yeah that's 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 how things are at mm -hmm. the moment um whether we do any more wipes in the future that depends on the kind of features we bring in or yeah. whether we can solve the the technological challenges of you know building these larger worlds and getting all the um islands in that we want to be in and, and stuff like yeah. that but ideally, we we never wipe, and we take the world forwards, and and you know put the systems in place to make the world be organic and grow and and last forever. Yeah.
So one of the things that uh, some of the players have been asking about um, is what is particular to this game that means that we have uh, seemingly quite a high volume of bugs compared to the number of features that we're able to put out. Yeah, so uh, this is twofold really. There's, a, oh, there's two, reason, two big reasons for it. One is that doing physics is tough. Mm. Doing physics in a network game is even tougher. Yeah. And then doing physics in a network game that's also a massively multiplayer online game is just ridiculous. Like A lot of people avoid doing that and for good reason, it's hard. And so because of this, we can have the most innocuous little bug seemingly become the biggest thing and like take all our resources to fix. Like something like um, a ship traveling from one side of the world to the other. Quite a, you know, important event in the game. We want to make sure it's correct. So when you get things like all of a sudden the ship just explodes and you know, you don't know why, um, it, it can be tr quite tra tricky to track down um, because of the way our technology works. We, we re represent our world with multiple servers. Like we have, uh, I'd say about 300 servers running the game at the moment, doing things like physics simulations and, and um, you know, AI simulation and all this sort of stuff. And as you move through the world, we need to migrate you from one server to the other. Um, and well, we, which of course server migration and in a physics-based game, this is tricky because as you migrate from one server to the other, minute differences in the position of that ship on one server versus the other can mean that all of a sudden the ship frames kind of inside something else and then everything starts vibrating and blows up. Um, and it's quite tricky making sure that you ensure that doesn't happen, that you can actually track it down to it being a server migration problem and not just some other random physics bug, like maybe there was a tiny little rock in the world that you drove into and it caused it to explode. And it can, it can mean that some of our bugs, while seeming really simple and, you know, on the surface, uh, it's an easy fix, right? It's, it can actually take weeks and weeks of investigation to figure out what the issue is and then actually make sure it works. So just, just the fact of doing this type of game is quite difficult, makes some of the bugs a lot more challenging than we would have expected. Um, another reason is that um, you know, Boston Studios is, you know, compared to other larger games companies, quite small. We've got a small team working on World's Drift, um, and we don't have hundreds and hundreds of devs all you know, just plowing through bugs, which means that we need to prioritize our time creating features and fixing bugs. As we were racing towards closed beta, we were prioritizing features a lot more, which meant that bugs were sort of falling behind, and we weren't um, spending the time we needed to to ensure that those bugs were tackled. So we got to a point where, when we were trying to polish for the you know a, a the next the next stage of the game, and some of these bugs literally stop us building features until they're fixed. So we've got to fix these bugs. We've got to get them out of the way now, so we can then start working on new features. And you know we're doing our best to try and prioritize those while like bringing in new features while fixing bugs. But sometimes it's just so many bugs that we need to fix, or the bugs take so long that it can mean that the features are a little bit slower than we like. But that's not always going to be the case. As polish is completed and we're getting closer and closer to you know a complete game, well, as complete as a game like this can be anyway, um, that you know we will be able to then spend more time bringing more features out and less yeah. time fixing bugs okay. and things like that. I guess another thing as well is obviously we are expanding the team somewhat at the moment, so hopefully we'll have more hands on deck. To, yeah, we'll never get to 100 devs, no. but uh, we've gone from three to a lot more than that, yeah. so that's good. <laughs> Turns out three, probably not enough. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not for an MMO, no. no. <laughs> All right, thank you for sitting down with us, Tristan. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's been an absolute joy. Um, not I, really. But... <laughs> I hope everyone at home has learned something today, because I sure have. Um, you have a great day. Uh, make sure you subscribe, uh, like, follow us on Facebook, and... All the things. Uh, Trello. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. Yeah, Trello. No, Twitter. Trello. Yeah, Trello. Trello. Yeah. Our Twitter's pointless now, so it's good. It's good. Okay, uh, follow us on all, all the social media, especially Elo. That's what I was going for. <laughs> Remember that one, guys? No. No? Cool. All right, then. Uh, I love you. Bye. Perfect outro. <laughs> Got it in one? Oh, that was so good. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well done. All right. Recorded. 23 minutes. Easy.
Lovely.